I'm gonna, I work for the Alberta Community and Cooperative Association, so we're the uh, association of cooperatives uh, in, and credit unions in the province, as well as some rural municipalities uh, and some other uh, organizations, ag societies, and uh, some business revitalization zones that work in the area of kind of, I mean, co-ops are all about community, local ownership, and local control. And I think in today's economy, that's a pretty good strategy to go for it. So uh, I'm gonna talk about um, how, how co-ops are used to, to raise capital and an innovative program that we've developed called Unleashing Local Capital that some of you may be uh, familiar with. Has anyone been to, uh, heard about Sangudo uh, Opportunity Development Co-op? Okay, yeah. Or uh, Westlock uh, Terminals, New Generation Co-op? Okay. You've been on the webinar, the, or we, we know each other. So, so there's some of the, so I guess before I get started, um, who, who here is a member of a co-op? Okay, a couple, all right. Okay, so I, I won't go into like the whole kind of co-ops 101, really I, I wanna kind of get to the whole bit, but a co-op is a, a member owned and democratically con controlled uh, enterprise and it's created to meet a need. It's not created to, to really get rich, um, although there are a lot of really successful co-ops in the province. Um, I also thought it was interesting in the presentation uh, this morning where he mentioned Nellie McClung and she was uh, a member of uh, United Farmers of Alberta as well as their, their women's auxiliary and so they kind of organized within the co-op before they became uh, as kind of paralleling the suffrage movement. So there's something interesting there and I think that that's a good indicator that co-ops are about you know, being a business and being a successful business, meeting a need in a community, but they can also do lots of different things and I think that's a really good example of it. Um, just to kind of put it out there, um, so I know we were talking earlier about like who's a, who's a farmer or an aspirational farmer or other places that uh, you know, people are in this, in this local food system, but I want to think, I want you to kind of think, I guess, of, of wearing your investor hat. Who here uh, is an investor or has an RSP or somebody? You don't have to put up some hands and be like, how much, how much does everybody have? No. <laughs> you get really personal. <laughs> But I want to I want to pose this question. So so how much is an like and, and again we don't have to, to talk about this, but like how much is enough when you're thinking of return on investment, and, and what does that look like? Okay, how much do I need to retire to do these other things? Okay, but if you were to combine this with how much is enough plus I get to create jobs in my community, I get to invest in, in agriculture, I get to invest in something that's different. So currently, where where is your money sitting? Do you, can you, do you have a, do you have a sense of, 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 of where it is and what it's doing? It's uh, Saturday morning, I, <laughs> whatever, where is your mind? But, but most of it, I mean, the majority of us, it kind of leaves, you know, our financial advisor will, will put it into a mutual fund or into stocks and bonds, and it's gonna, it's gonna end up on the global market. And, and I think what's interesting, though, is that, you know, again, co-ops are about the local economy. Uh, and and this here this conference is is about local food, so I think that that's that's really the connection I want to talk about. So, um, so I guess really looking at the the start, uh, I want to uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how co-ops have been used to provide uh, strategic uh, advantage to in, in agriculture as well as raising capital, which we're here talking about today, uh, and then also maybe looking at how it strengthens strengthens the, the the sector. So if we think in 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 kind of the looking at uh, maybe going um, way back, uh, or I mean they still exist today, but when we think of raising capital uh, through a cooperative structure in agriculture, it would be definitely producer co-ops. So you see farmers that are owning, say, a dairy co-op or the, a grain terminal or the value added to it. And that's, that's basically the opportunity to own part of a business that a farmer is using on, on a regular basis, as well as the, maybe not just to own part of that business as you would invest, kind of wearing your investor hat, but more as the user of that business and owning part of it. The idea that owning part of a, of a, of a, of a dairy co-op means that you have uh, more price stability, you have different revenue sources, as well as um, able to uh, be part of a, a community of, of dairy farmers and, and being able to, to do more, that, that's there. As well, when we think of, of the, the, uh, the farming community, that, not, that, that it's often difficult to, to, have, to raise the capital to go it alone and, and, and uh, buy that facility individually, right? So, or, and then I guess the last bit is, is the, if, if you don't own the, the, uh, the, the ice cream factory, the yogurt, or what have you. Uh, I'm not a farmer, so. Uh, but, uh, but, but that if it's owned by someone else, that you might have, a, you can often have an antagonistic relationship, that they, can, that they can use their position to determine the price that they're gonna buy from you, right? 
So, so, that's, so that's kind of one of the first examples through a producer co-op um, being able to raise capital and invest it locally. That would be through the member shares as well as, as the, the, the members using it. And those are very successful businesses. Um, but also when we kind of taking our, on our investor hat, we'll say, well, the return on investment might not be that great. How profitable is, is the co-op from year to year? It might, be around, it might be incredibly resilient and a safe investment. It might not turn a huge return, but it's also reducing the cost to the producer. And that, when we combine it with the return on investment, is incredibly important, as well when we're thinking of the community investing. I think community investing is something we see, basically if you're in any business today, you have to have a green program or support some type of activity in your community. But this kind of economic development, business development role is community investing, probably that's, that's where they get the language from. So that's, that's kind of, I, I'd say, looking at producer co-ops. Now, in, in, does anybody know what a new generation co-op is? Some hands, yeah. Okay, so, so those, um, uh, really, so in, in a cooperative it's basically you have one member, one vote, one type of member, and they're using it for a specific need. So dairy farmers own the, the dairy pool, things like that. Um, but in a new generation co-op, they were created to bring in non-voting member investors to be able to raise capital around value-added agriculture. So in, in, across Western Canada, they created legislation under the, the respective Cooperatives Act to allow a, n a new type of member that could be an investor. So when we're thinking instead of, say, buying a share on the Toronto Stock Exchange, you could buy it locally. And those have been quite successful. So uh, I'll just briefly give the story of uh, anybody who, well, those of you that know Westlock, or know no, about the terminal, but who here has been to Westlock? Okay. All right. So, so the town of Westlock is, is uh, they were they were uh, they were going to lose the terminal. Agricor, uh, which is a, a giant multinational agro business, um, they wanted to buy the terminal, and uh, it was a profitable terminal, but it wasn't profitable enough for Agricor. And Agricor had other plans for for how they were going to manage grain grain in the area. They were going to shut that one down and build one in Edmonton, uh, and that was great for Agricor. And also, when you know, saying if you had invested in Agricor, it'd be great. I think wearing your investor hat it would be a great return on your investment. However, it was terrible for 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 Westlock. Right? If you were farming there, you were going to have to truck your grain to Edmonton, which was an added uh, transportation cost. Uh, as well, thinking of all those businesses in the town of Westlock would, would be impacted by the, uh, you know, just, just the lack of money in the community. Uh, there was, you know, people really saw kind of the writing on the wall. What happens if a couple of businesses leave the community? What if a couple of people decide not to be farming anymore? What would that do? Would you lose the school? Where's the vibrancy? So they looked at lots of different strategies and they landed on a, a new generation co-op. And they really, they put it out to the broader community saying to the farmers, uh, grain farmers, we are directly impacted by it, but the rest of the community might want to invest in this as well, and, our, and there's a mutual success. It took a lot of leadership, a lot of people to say, let's invest locally, let's, let's raise a couple million dollars and, and buy this terminal, and they did. They raised the money in quite short order, and they were very successful, and what's great though too, and, and it, it, it's a much better story than I'm telling it now. Like, the, like the, 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 this is a really, really interesting, um, when we talk about local investing, like it, it's about people and, and about people really pulling together. Um, but they, they, th this terminal has gone on to raise capital a number of times, not because they're in trouble, because they're expanding. They've renovated, they've expanded. Um, they're now more, they, more uh, cars, uh, more tons of grain come through Westlock than the AgriCorp facility in Edmonton. It's one of the most profitable grain terminals in Western Canada. So that's interesting too, because when you direct capital, when, you, when people are doing it, uh, active in their local economy, um, we can see these outcomes uh, that are really uh, successful. So, so based on this model, then looking at, at Sangudo, so, so we could kind of think of the new generation co-op as like under the umbrella you have kind of two types of members. Now, uh, Sangudo did a similar model, so I counted the people in this room, there's about 25 of you. Uh, have you ever thought about buying a meat shop together? If you, when you think <laughs> of that, the, the, the money that you put away, do you, so, so in Sangudo, a, a, a small, like a really small community, about 300 people, and there, there was a, a small group of people, say like maybe the, the people at this table or these tables together, and they say, we want, we got to turn this town around. Uh, so they were, and, and again, it was looking to economic development as a strategy. So they saw, you know, if we could pool some money together collectively, let's invest it back into, into Sangudo. So they looked around at, at what opportunities there were there and there was a meat shop that uh, had been, a guy had been trying to sell for a couple of years and no one was interested in owning, you know, a kind of old, you know, a bit of an outdated abattoir in, in Sangudo. But for the community there, they were like, well, we might be able to make it work. 
So they were 22 people, so less than, than in this room, each put in $10,000 and bought the meat shop, uh, all the equipment, the land, and then they leased it to two entrepreneurs. Okay. So just think about that. If, if, if let's say, you, you're, you own the business and there's two people you know to lease it, how, how would that relationship look? Okay, that's okay, don't, don't jump in. It's, uh, <laughs> but, but the idea is that, is that you want them to succeed, right? You might catch them a break. It might be a little bit different than, than the other lenders uh, that are there. Or, uh, so, so what they did in Sangudo is they said, well, we'll put a floor on your lease payments and then we'll take a percentage of your monthly uh, gross revenue. So the better you do, the better we do and will also help you get up and started. So that's an example. They've gone on to do now five investments. They bought a, a legion, they renovated, uh, reinvested back into the, uh, into the meat shop. Now they're doing housing. They create 14 jobs. Right? So, so the, this is, a, I, I guess, an example um, and, and, and looking at, at how this could be uh, replicated in, in other areas. Um, and, and I think it comes down to, again, that there has to be a shift in kind of the, the thinking about capital when we're thinking about that, that where, where our money can be placed. I mean, we definitely wouldn't recommend that you put your entire savings that you salted away on a meat shop in Sangudo or whatever the equivalent it, it is in your community, but part of it. The other part too, I think, is having this really strong local awareness of what's going on in your community. And, and for those of you working in local food, you have an acute awareness of, of what's going on. Um, in, in Nova Scotia, there's a, a local investment fund, they're called Community Economic Development Investment Funds, and there's one called Farmworks, and they, they invest in value-added agriculture, a lot of breweries and, you know, uh, more, you know, artisanal stuff. But I was talking to their board chair, and I thought, I, I'll never forget this, but there was, she was like, you know, we were always trying to get people to buy local, right? You've got to convince people to buy the, the tomatoes that are twice as expensive, that was her thing. Because, you know, it feels good, and, we, and we're part of this movement, we're, and, and we're voting with our dollars. But she's like, if you invest one dollar in that farm, you're, you, you're, you, are, you are hyper aware of where every dollar you invest and spend is. And I think that that idea of ownership uh, and, and owning the solution, owning the problem. So, so again, I guess I kicked it up by saying, you know, what's, what's enough for the return on investment? Um, definitely that, that the return has to be viable. If, if Sangudo hadn't worked, if, if Westlock hadn't worked, that would have come, you know, that, that, that would have been tragic. People would have lost money, but at the same time, we wouldn't be having this conversation here today. I think that people uh, have, have an awareness of their communities. There has to be the due diligence, and of course, what, like the work that, that's gone in here uh, in terms of assessing the, wh where you would invest and why is, in, is incredibly important. But there is a mechanism um, through, through a cooperative that, uh, that, that, that could be used. Um, with the Alberta Community and Cooperative Association, we work with groups to help form an opportunity development co-op, which is then able to pool capital through the sale of RSP and TFSA eligible shares. And then that volunteer board assesses a local opportunity and invests in it. And that can be debt, that can be equity, it could be buying land or buying a facility. And so these are all options that are there. So if, um, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up. Um, just kind of thinking that, you know, the, uh, I, I think that there's a lot of parallels between the local food movement and, and, and more sustainable agriculture and this type of investing. We, uh, we've gotten disconnected with our money. And I think we've also become disconnected with our with our food. I think that there's a there's a way that some of the, these skills, as well as as looking you know looking inward and looking local, can can uh, do a lot of benefits. So I'm excited to be here and and all the conversations I'm hearing. And uh, yeah, thank you.